been a busy, busy summer, and it's almost over, which means it's time to send our kiddos back to school. On August 16th, we will do a Youth Sunday where we pray over all of our children and all of our teachers and our schools. So we want to make sure that you guys mark it on your calendars to bring your children and to be here for 8.30, 10, or 11.30 service on Sunday, August the 16th. We have a big announcement. For those of you who aren't aware, we're starting a Boys and Girls Club in our community center. It's a community initiative. We're very, very proud to be uh, behind it, and we'd appreciate your prayer and support. One way to support the future Boys and Girls Club is to join us on August 28th. That's a Friday night for Glow Cabot. You heard it, Glow Cabot. It's a family fun run and walk, 5K. It'll be a measured route, and we are gonna have some fun. Um, starting about 6 o'clock till about 8 o'clock, we'll have a family carnival. It's a multi-church initiative also, so lots of other churches are going to be involved with us and helping out with that. So we'd love to have you. Registration will be available soon. I've got a huge save the date for you guys for new. September 13th. That is our four-year anniversary, and we're going to celebrate big. We're going to have one service at 10 a.m., and we want every single person who calls Renew home to come together and celebrate this amazing milestone. So make sure to mark your calendars right now for September the 13th and join us at 10 a.m. for our big service. Life is crazy, and we know that you are busy. Here at Renew, we really want to make things as convenient for you as possible. If you download the Renew app on your smartphone, you have access to all kinds of information. You've got your church calendar and your events, and you can give online in a matter of seconds. It's a great way to stay connected and know what's new at Renew. Well, good morning, Renew. All right, let's stand on up. God, we thank you so much for being a God who loves us. Father, we pray that everything that we do in this place invites you to be here among us in a mighty way. God, we thank you. We praise you. We love you in the matchless name of Jesus.
guys can go ahead and take a seat. Hi, my name's Dean, and uh, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why we give and why we tithe and the importance of it. Uh, our family personally, um, over many years, have, have given off and on. Um, from time to time, we'll, we adjust our, what we give, but through, uh, through prayer, through the lessons that we've discussed uh, with Spencer during services, and really have sat down and discussed on what's important to us, uh, and the reason that, that we give is, is mainly because of, of what God's called us to do. Uh, he's blessed our family in so many ways, uh, and one of those ways happens to be a little bit financially, and we want to be able to give back. We know that uh, the people here at Renew and, and what God will do through them uh, will be a positive impact on uh, just not our church, but our community, and what we're able to do with the gifts uh, that we give back and we know that God will use those in the right way. I love hearing those giving testimonies. Do you guys enjoy hearing those? I do. I really enjoy hearing those about just our church family and the growth that they've had in this area of their lives. And we pray for all that growth in each, each and every one of our lives when it comes to giving, when it comes to serving, when it comes to praying, when it comes to, of course, being more and more like, like Christ. And that's always, of course, our ultimate goal. We want to be more like Christ every single day. And I pray that for myself, too. doesn't mean I'm perfect. I falter in that often, but I long to be more like Christ. You know, when Dean talked about um, just their understanding as far as what this is and, and what the whole um, expectation is of us living in alignment with God, it, he talked about, of course, that, un that understanding and giving because that's what God wants us to do. But he also talked about, of course, the things that God does with that and how he helps so many in our community, how he helps so many even in other communities. And Spencer's going to speak on that this morning a little bit as far as other churches that we've helped plan and the impact that we're having, not just here in this community, but throughout uh, the Midwest, and throughout the region, of course, and we're sending a uh, missions team out too later. But when Dean mentioned that, maybe think of 2 Corinthians 9. Paul's right to that church in Corinth. And uh, he's uh, encouraging them to give as they had intended to give to the church in Jerusalem for those that were in need. And he, he writes this. He says, This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, the giving, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ. I just love that. Men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And that's really what it's all about in so many ways is that God can do so much more with our money than we can do with our, on our own. And we understand that he's Lord over all things. So as we take up offering this morning, I just pray that you reflect on all that he is doing and moving just within our own hearts, within this church community. And, um, and he is at work, even in a world that seems upside down in many, in many cases, in many days, he is still at work here. And amen to that. If you're a guest this morning, thank you for being here. We're honored by your presence. We prayed for you, but please do not feel obligated to give uh, in this moment. Let's pray. Father God, we honor you and praise you for who you are. I thank you for the blessing you've given me in my life in so many different ways. And I think you've blessed so many of us in areas that we see and areas that we don't even recognize. Father, you are sovereign over all things. You control all things. You do not need us to give back to you, Father. You created all things, but you yearn for relationship with us, Father. We know those things that we love, we can't help but give to, Father. We want to give to you in more ways uh, than some way that some may feel possible at times within our certain circumstances. But, Father, we pray uh, that as we give, it's with joyful expectation to see what you're going to do, Father, because you've already done so much. It's in Christ that we pray. Amen.
Father, we affirm that that is true. That those aren't just words on a screen, but that your love is higher and wider and deeper than anything else. And I pray, Father, that we experience that today. I pray that those that don't believe that it's true will experience your love today. I pray that those who are confused about you or concerned or have no idea who you are whatsoever, that you will reveal your love and your strength in each one today. I pray that as we come together, that you will teach us, guide us, and move us. And that when we leave this place today, we are different than when we came in. And so we continue our worship, Father, as we open up the pages of Scripture to see all the things that you have in mind for us. And I pray in the name of Jesus that you open our eyes to see your power and your presence as we come together now. We praise you for all of it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. You can have a seat. You know, it is uh, so good to be back with you today. Uh, you know, we just uh, got back from summer camp uh, yesterday afternoon. It is our second go-around of summer camp for the summer. And uh, it was great to sleep in my own bed last night and not get poked in the stomach by a little kid going, I need to pee. So it was great. So I didn't experience that. It was great to have a night of sleep uh, in a good climate control environment. It was wonderful. And, uh, and I got to tell you, though, you know, summer camp's a beautiful thing. Get the kids away. Help them to unplug from the craziness of the world and to get them and have their full attention. And this week was our little kids camp, third through fifth grade. And just to be able to pour into those children and, and help them to see who God is. With the, whole, with the whole desire to help them to fall in love with God more and more and to start that at an early age, it's so important. And I will tell you, one of the things that impressed me the most is the number of uh, the leaders here at Renew that really aren't overseeing youth ministry or children's ministry at all, but decided to come and be a part of that and teach the kids, sleep in the same bunk houses and pour into these kids. That's a wonderful and amazing thing. And just so thankful for all those that were a big part of that. But it was good uh, to be there, but it's even better to be back home and to be with you now. But also I was gone last week and uh, my daughter and I took a trip uh, up and visited another church and spent some time there. And that was a great experience too. And I'll tell you more about that. But I'll tell you, anytime that we're gone or anytime that I'm gone, I'll speak for myself. Anytime that I'm gone, whether it's church related, out speaking at a conference or, or going to uh, an event or helping to coach another church planter, which is something that I get to spend a fair amount of time doing, help to mentor and coach them and encourage them. Whether it's for things like that or whether we're on vacation or whatever, I will tell you, I miss being here. I miss being in this place with you. Uh, I yearn to be here and to worship with you. I love the opportunities that God has given us to be able to have so many people to come into this moment because there's nothing that can replace this. There's something unique and special and beautiful about coming together. And I will tell you one of the things that I pray about all the time for you is not just that your life is transformed and changed because we do pray for that for you all the time, but also that you too will yearn to be here, that you will love to be here, that you will not allow the world and all the craziness of the world to stand in the way and to distract you from coming because there's, like I said, there's nothing that can replace this. And part of my heart's desire for you is that you see that, especially as we see the world getting crazier and crazier and crazier, that you will yearn more and more and more to come together and that we can worship together and love one another and encourage each other in all those things. And so it is good to be back and to be able to do that with you. But last week, um, my, my daughter and I, we went up to Fayetteville. There's another church up there. It's called City Point. It's a, it is a church plant. They've been around for about three years. They're about to celebrate their three-year anniversary. They have very similar uh, ideas and and uh, DNA to renew, and we've gotten an opportunity to go up and coach them and encourage them and help them. There are about 100 people, which is normal for a church plant. Renew is unusual in how much we have grown in the course of four years, which we're about to celebrate our fourth anniversary. But they're about three years old, and they're doing great things. They have a great facility there, and God was there when we were there. God was there. There's no question. He was present. Uh, when Hannah and I drove up to Fayetteville on Sunday morning and then drove back, 
we had an opportunity to worship together in the car. I don't know if you ever do that or not, but it's great to turn the radio up as loud as you want. And you can just worship and stop at stoplights. And don't stop singing when you have to stop light. Let everybody know what you're doing. I mean, roll the window down. Let them hear that Chris Tomlin music, you know, and just praise the Lord. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. But we got to worship in the car. We listened to a couple different, you know, CDs and just enjoyed that time. Just she and I singing together, singing praises to God, but also praying. We prayed for you because we knew we wouldn't see you uh, last week, but we prayed for you as we always do. And we prayed for other pastors around the country and uh, had Hannah text them for me. And uh, she would text them and let them know, we're praying for you this morning, lives are changed, you have the right words to say, all those things. And God was there in that car going up and back and forth to Fayetteville. It was a beautiful thing. But God was also moving in another place over in Austin, Texas. There's a church there um, that uh, we have done a lot with. It's called Catalyst of Austin. This is a brand new church plant, and uh, we've invested a lot of time in them. These guys have come out here, and they've spent time with us to learn, to see what it is that Renew is up to, the kind of ways that we think and process through things, the way that we do things. And they've taken a lot of that back with them. Although it's a little different context than what uh, Cab at Arkansas is. They're in more of an urban type setting, but they're doing a lot of those different things. And uh, this is one of the churches that we've really been instrumental in helping to get started. We invested, uh, Renew invested $25,000 in this church plant. Now, that, I don't want you to be uh, confused by that. That does not mean Renew is a rich church. It is the opposite of that. We are a church plant. But we believe that um, giving is an important thing. One of the things Travis talked about is that we want to give back. We think that the way that God does things is you're blessed in order to be a blessing. And so from the very beginning of Renew, we committed to tithing on everything that comes in that offering bucket. And so 10% of everything that goes in that bucket on Sunday, we send 10% of that out or we save it and then we invest that into other church plants because we believe that's the fastest way to reach lost people is to help plant churches. And this is one of them that we've invested financially, but also invested a lot of time, a lot of energy, and um, a lot of prayer time for them. And on Sunday, uh, they had their first two baptisms, and that's beautiful and exciting. And they haven't even launched yet. They won't launch until September, but they're already in the community, already doing things, already doing big serves just like we do, and making an impact in that city. And God was there last week while we were here, while you were here, while we were in Fayetteville. And then there's another church, Blanchard, Oklahoma, another church called Restore. Again, very similar to Renew. We helped get them started. We financially supported them, and we've coached them. I talk to Jesse every other week and coach him and mentor him and encourage him and help them with questions and how they're to do things. They're about to celebrate their one-year anniversary, but lives are being changed every time they come together, and God is there as well. And then on Sunday here at Renew, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of you gathered together here to worship, to pray, to celebrate, to love one another. And Kirk did a great job preaching. I will say I'm very thankful that we broadcast this. You know, we have people all over the country that are a part of Renew by watching online. We even have somebody in Canada. Haven't quite figured out who that is. If you're watching, let us know who you are. But we have people in Canada and all over the country that are a part of Renew watching online. But it's beautiful that we can record that. And so on our way back from Fayetteville, I was able to catch up on the sermon from Sunday. I hope you do that too when you're out of town. But was able to listen in and to tune in. And Kirk did a great job. Very thankful to people like Carmen Mallard and others who make the uh, uh, streaming thing possible. That's great. But he said a couple of things that really struck me and really stuck out in my mind. One of those is uh, a really important word, and um, it's a part of who God is. It is about his nature, and that is that God is sovereign. This is an important word. It is a churchy word. We don't usually use that word. You might if you watch the national news, you hear about sovereign this and that or whatever. But it's one of those words we don't usually define. But we need to make sure we define it because God is sovereign. So if you were to go look up sovereignty in the dictionary, you'd see it's superior, greatest, supreme in power, authority, rule, independent of all others. Ultimately, though, all it really means is that God is in absolute control. That he's in control of the past, he's in control of the present, he's in control of the future over everything. He has power and authority over nature, kings, kingdoms, rulers, over history, over angels, over demons. Even the devil is uh, underneath his ability to have power because God has ultimate power. 
And so the devil even has to get permission before he can act. God is the ultimate source of power and authority in every way, over everything, everything that exists. And only God can make those claims. And this is one reason we worship him, because ultimately he is ultimately in control. He has ultimate power over everything. And this is an important word. This is an important part of his nature. This is the series that we're talking about this summer. Is who is God? How do we understand his nature and the essence of who he is? And this is one of those things. Now the other word that Kirk used that really struck me was sanctified or sanctification. This again is another churchy word that we don't usually talk about very often. And you've got to make sure you define it well. And so when I heard sanctification, we got together on Monday and we had lunch. And we were talking about the day. And this word jumped out at me and I had an image in my mind that I wanted to share with you about sanctification. Because sanctification is a process by setting something apart for use. To use it for something else or to use it for something sacred. Or really it is to clean it up, to clean the vessel. But as I thought through it, there was an image in my mind, and it's a picture of this. So let's say that you were to go out to the thrift shop later today, and you see this beautiful bowl on the shelf. And you love it, and you think to yourself, this would make an excellent soup bowl. You could just envision taking this home, putting it in the centerpiece of your table, and using it to serve soup to your friends and your family when they come over for dinner. And, and it would be important if you bought this at a thrift store that you would wash it. Do you think? Do you agree that you would want to wash it once, twice, 200 times, something like that? Not knowing what was in it before, you would want to make sure that thing is squeaky clean. Like you'd wash it out, smell it, yep, okay. Hey, want to check this out? Is this clean? What do you think? Yeah, especially once you found out that your newfound soup bowl is actually a chamber pot. You'd want to make sure you sanctify that thing. Do you agree? A cha- and for those of you not old enough to know what a chamber pot is, back once upon a time in this country as well, toilets weren't always inside your house. And so you had a pot that you hid underneath your bed. And when you needed to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, you didn't go put a coat on and go outside. You just went in the pot and then you took care of that the next day. That's what that is, a beautiful chamber pot that is now your new favorite soup bowl. You'd make sure it's sanctified. Clean that sucker and clean it. Now, if you're me, you would never use it as a soup bowl. But you would want to make sure that thing is cleaned out, that it's set apart for a special purpose, and that whatever junk filled it once before is emptied, and now it's clean. And this is what God calls us to be. And as we get to know God, as we get to know who he is, as we begin to understand the mind of Christ and the heart of Christ, and we hopefully begin to see like he sees and hear like he hears, feel like he feels, go where he'd go, touch like he touches, as he begins to transform us and change us and we fall in love with him and that love overflows out of us into everybody else, it is a process of sanctification that cleans the junk out of our pot and makes us clean and usable. That's the process that all of us are in for a lifetime. That no matter how nasty we once were on the inside, that God can make us clean. This is the process of sanctification. These are the kinds of things that Kirk talked about last week. And God was here. And God is here now, just like it says in Matthew 18 and 20, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am. I'm there in the middle of that when two or three are gathered together. And so there are and there were worshipers all over this world last week. While you were here worshiping or where I was in Fayetteville and they were in Austin and others in Blanchard, there were others in China or Saudi Arabia or Canada or Mexico or wherever honoring Christ and God was there. And it's as we go get ready for the Dominican Republic, there's a team of us that are about to head out on Saturday this week. We will go get on an airplane and we will fly to the Dominican Republic. There is a team of us. I'm going on this trip too which is a little outside of my own comfort zone. This will be my first foreign mission trip. But as we do that, we have to understand that God's already there. 
He's already working. He's already moving. Yes, we'll bring something with us, but it's not like we're bringing God there for the first time. God is already there. He's already working. He's already cleansing. He's already convicting and moving and changing and transforming. And though, although God lives within us who believe, because that's the promise that he puts a part of himself in us, the Holy Spirit to reside in us, we'll go there, but he's already there. He's already working and we'll go and we'll share the good news with those people. But the question is, how is it possible? How is it possible that God will be here at Renew and in Fayetteville and in Blanchard and Dominican and China and Canada and Mexico, all over the world, many of which they're not getting to do what we're doing right here. They're hiding it's a secret church kind of situation because they could be persecuted and killed for doing what we're doing right here. That's going on all over the world. But how is it that God can be in all those places all at once? It's difficult to ha- comprehend because we can't, we can't be in two places at once. I wish we could. I wish next Sunday I could be here and the Dominican Republic. The weather will be the same. That should, you should laugh at that one. The weather should be the same in Arkansas as it is in the Dominican Republic, because it will be. I wish, but I wish I could be here and there, but I can't. We can't, we can't be in two places at once. Even our favorite superheroes can't. That's why we're still designed this way. This was our vacation Bible school theme, and we talked about superheroes only as a parable or as an analogy to help us understand who God is better, to teach our kids that way. Even the greatest superheroes, which are all make-believe, None of them can be everywhere at once. It's only God. Only God can be everywhere at once because it is God who is omnipresent. Now, omnipresent is a fancy word that uh, omni is Latin, O-M-N-I. It's Latin for all. And so God is all present. Now, we don't see the word omnipresent in the Bible itself, but we see indications of God's presence, that he is everywhere at all times, all space and time, that God is there. We see it all throughout Scripture. Let me show you. Proverbs 15, 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Colossians 1.17, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Matthew 18.20, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Isaiah 43.2, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they'll not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you won't be burned. The flame shall not consume you. Why? Because God is there, that he is all present. Deuteronomy 31.6, be strong and courageous. Do not fear. Or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. By the way, I'm convinced every time I've read that today, I've had this strong sense to say to you, some of you need to write that one down and memorize it. And you need to quote it to yourself over and over again when life gets crazy. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. Why? Because he is everywhere. He is all present, omnipresent. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. The reason we're going to go to the Dominican Republic. The reason that we go and we serve in this community every day. We don't just serve once in a while. This is the heart of renew, to be the hands and feet and to take this great commission seriously. That is, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, not just Cabot. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe or obey all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you. I am with you. Even to the end of the age, God is present. Isaiah 57, 15. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. What's that saying? God's everywhere, especially with those who have a broken heart and who are humble before the Lord. Job eleven seven through 9. Can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? It is higher than the heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol or deeper than death? What can you know? Its measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. This is part of what we were describing and we were singing about, that his love is higher and deeper and wider. This comes right out of that uh, Romans 8, 35 through 39. It's that promise. God is there and active and moving and loving in every way. 
Deuteronomy 31.8, it's the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Ephesians 4 and 6, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And then Hebrews 4.13, last one. No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Now, I will freely admit to you that being able to comprehend the idea of omnipresence is difficult. The ability to comprehend that God can be everywhere at all times is very challenging, I think, to my own mind. But I think it's true with all of the attributes of God. Everything we've been talking about this summer, that God is all-powerful and omniscient, which is that he is all-knowing, which Kirk will talk about next week. Please don't skip out, even though we'll be in the DR. I want you here and learning and growing and praying for us, please. But he's omniscient. But in this omnipresence, it's hard to comprehend what these things mean. And I think it is because it, we can't even grasp what eternity means. If we could grasp eternity. If we could understand that, I think it would make it easier to understand the attributes of God, but we can't understand even eternity. We can't comprehend the idea of infinity that God has always been. Why? Because we're finite. We have a very definite beginning and a very definite end. And because of that, it's hard for us to understand something that could always be. We are so limited in our own flesh. We just can't see what unlimited looks like. It doesn't even compute And so what we end up doing, I think, most of the time in our world is that we anthropomorphize God. Now, again, another fancy word. It's not really a churchy word, although I've used it around here a few times. It's more of a philosophical word. But anthropomorphize, here's what it means. It means I'm going to attribute human characteristics onto a non-human thing. So like if I were to punch this table... And you were to say, ooh, don't hurt the table's feelings by hurting it and hitting it so hard. You would be anthropomorphizing the table. Make sense? We also do it to God all the time. That we attribute our human characteristics, the way that we think, the way that we feel, onto God. This is why people say all the time, I can't believe in a God that would blah, 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 whatever. Well, what is the problem? They're attributing only human characteristics onto God. And they don't let God be who he is. And so because we are limited, because we are not all knowledgeable, we are not all powerful, we are not all knowing, for many it's hard for them to believe that anything could be. And part of that is the egocentricism of our society where we think we are the best of everything. But God is so much more, so much more. But we, we see things in a linear way, in a sequential way. We see things as very definitive past present and future and whether something's past or present it's just depending on our perspective if you're looking at it this way and I'm looking at it this way it's going to change or even the reality of our past wouldn't you agree that our past the way that we perceive our past can change at times depending on what's going on in our life if things are good we might see positive aspects of our past and if things aren't we may see negative aspects of it it's all based on our perspective but God is not that way. God's not limited by time or space. He's just not. In, in fact, it says in Revelation 1.8, he is the Alpha and the Omega. This is where Jesus is using um, the Greek alphabet, the beginning and the end of the Greek alphabet, where he's saying the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty, that God is all-powerful. That's that om- omnipotent word, the Almighty. He's eternal, he's almighty, and he's all-present, which means he spans time and space, that he is over everything. He rules simultaneously over time and over humanity, beyond any physical limitations of a linear way of thinking. He is not limited that way. One of the things I've said around here a few times that I love, I love the imagery, and that is that God paints on a canvas bigger than our eyes can behold. That our eyes can only see a limited view. And we, even our past, we have a hard time seeing the full picture of it. Even our present sometimes, I think we have a hard time seeing the entirety of what's going on in our present circumstances. Would you agree that even in our present circumstances, we're still limited We're limited by our vision. We're limited by our comprehension of any given circumstance. And we're certainly limited in seeing our future. But not God. He paints on a a canvas bigger than our eyes can behold. Which really calls us to trust Him. 
to trust him, even when things don't look right right now or they haven't looked right in the past and they may not even look right to us in the future, to trust him because he sees it all. He is not limited like we are to clear delineations of past, present, future. He sees it all. And he's over all and in all and through all because he is present in all of it. He's not contained in some box. We love containers. We love to compartmentalize our lives. But we can't do it with God. He's too big. Solomon understands this. He said in 1 Kings 8, 27, But will God really dwell on the earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you. How much less this temple? Solomon understands that God isn't going to fit in some temple. God's too big for this kind of thing. He's present and ruling all the kingdoms. Isaiah 66 and 1 through 2 says, This is what the Lord says, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Can you picture that in your head? Can you just picture it in your mind's eye? This doesn't mean the earth is trash. This doesn't mean that he's kicking his feet up because he's uninterested in it. It's just an issue of his uh, immensity, that he is enormous, that he is above and beyond all things. In fact, that's what A.W. Tozer said. God is so immense that the universe cannot contain him. Though he is in everything, he is not confined or contained by his creation. Instead, he contains it. So whereas we like to container, put things in containers, we like to have very neat, orderly, sequential things, which almost never actually happens in our real lives, God is beyond any of that. That he contains all of those things. Now, here's, there's a danger, though, in talking about omnipresence. It's easy to get confused, and I don't want you to be. But one of the areas that a lot of people get confused is they think that because he is everywhere at all times, then he must be bringing a blessing all the time. Or that when he is present, it is a sign of acceptance that I'm doing whatever I want to do, and because God is here, it must be okay. This is not true. This is a gross misunderstanding. The reality is is that sin, which is simply defined as going our own way, going against what God desires. When we sin, it separates us relationally from God. It separates the relationship. Isaiah 59.2 says, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he doesn't hear there's another one, Proverbs 15, 29. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. That's scary. It just is. What's it mean? It means God is present. He's not absent because of our sin, because of our habitual sin, because we continue to fill the chamber pot with sin and with junk. It doesn't mean that he's absent. It doesn't mean that he stopped loving But what it does mean is that our sin and full of the nastiness, it separates us relationally from God. Maybe an easier example would be this. You and one other person whom you do not get along with could be sitting theoretically on the same couch. You're present together, but relationally you're divided. Does that make sense? Or maybe a courtroom, maybe that would be a better picture. You're in a courtroom with someone. You're suing them, they're suing you. Relationship is totally separated, but physically you're in the same place. This is a picture that God is present everywhere, but our sin will separate us relationally from God. Now, omnipresence also does not mean pantheism. And you need to make sure you don't get confused by that. There are many who would say, because God is everywhere, then I can worship the trees and kiss the rocks because those are also God. This is not true. That God is everywhere, that doesn't mean that we worship the trees. That doesn't mean that we worship the creation. And in fact, Romans 125 makes that really clear that there is a dramatic danger in worshiping the creation instead of the creator. Omnipresence does not mean pantheism. Omnipresence means you're never alone. That God is always present. God is everywhere and God is here. Tozer also said, God being spirit is right here and he will never be any further away or never any closer than he is right now. And I think that's incredibly comforting. It's incredibly beautiful, incredibly wonderful 
that it's impossible for God to be further away or closer to you because he is fully present. Not a little bit of him over here or a little bit of him over there, but that he is fully present with us in this place with you now, that he is fully present. And so why is this so important? Well, I think God's omnipresence should impact us. I think it should impact us in a dramatic way, in fact. And I think one way that it impacts us, we see in Psalm 139, 7 through 10. Here's what it says. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your hand, your right hand will hold me fast. What's it mean? It means that God is everywhere. We can't run from him. Adam and Eve tried to. They're the first created people. They were given one thing that they shouldn't do. To eat from that tree in the middle of the garden. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the devil lied to him and said, you know, God's holding out on you. He's trying to keep you from something good. There's something so much better, but you've got to reach out and take it. Run after it. Go for it. You can't trust him. You shall surely not die. This is what the devil says. And they believe him. And they eat the fruit. Their eyes are opened. And what happens? The realization of their sin, that is to departure from what God called them to do and to be, their sin caused them to try to run from God. But they couldn't. They couldn't run. There's nowhere to run. God is everywhere. Another example is Jonah. I love the story of Jonah. I've encouraged you before, and I still want to encourage you if you haven't done it. Go look up Jonah. It's a book in the Old Testament. It's a beautiful book, the whole thing. And it's a great story that has modern-day implications for real. But the story of Jonah is a story of mercy and forgiveness where God wants to uh, draw the city of Nineveh back to himself. He wants them to repent, but they're terrible. These are terrible people. They're doing terrible, heinous, evil things. But God wants to restore them. And so he calls the prophet Jonah to go. And he tells Jonah what to do. And Jonah hates these people. And he does not want to go because he knows that God's a merciful God. And he knows that they're going to repent. And they're going to turn around. And Jonah doesn't want to have anything to do with it. And so what does Jonah do? He tries to run from God. How'd that work for him? It didn't work. Why? Because God is everywhere. God is present everywhere. And I would venture to guess that many of us in this room throughout the day today here at Renew, people watching online, there are many of us who have tried to run. At one time or another, there have been many of us who have tried to run. In fact, there's probably people here that are running right now. They're trying to hide from God. They don't want to be close. But the truth is, there is nowhere you can go that he is not. It's impossible. There's no place or time he wasn't, isn't, or won't be. The fact that God is omnipresent should affect us. It does. The second way that it affects us is that so often, I think, in this world, we feel dramatically lonely. I think we just feel lonely. Uh, The truth is, the research out there tells us that we have never had more communication in our culture Uh, at any point in time. We have more communication. It's easier to communicate now than it ever has been. But at the same time, we're more lonely than we have ever been. Isn't that interesting? Like you could get on your cell phone right now and text somebody that lives in China. You can have great communication, but we're still lonely. We could be in a room full of people and still feel lonely. And I think the devil uses that all the time, even in the church. I think the devil loves to come in and pick on people and say, see, you're not loved, you're all alone, you're surrounded, but you're lonely. But here's the thing, you are never alone. You are never alone. At least God is always there. And you can count on that because he reveals that it is his very nature to be present, and he is present always. Even in the darkest times, God is there. Mark 
uh, Matthew 6.6 6 kind of gives this idea. It says, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. What does that mean? We could spend the whole time just talking about that one verse. Here's one of the things that verse means. You, you may not be able to see God, but he sees you and he is present. And you don't need to be lonely because God is present and he will speak as you surrender your life and as you go to the word. People say to me all the time, God never talks to me. The answer is because you're probably not reading the Bible. God has lots to say and we've got to go and see what he has to say. And I will tell you, after all these years that I've been at it and all these years of reading, all these years of studying, all these years of prayer, God still speaks to me new ways when I read things that I've read a hundred times. And God's willing to speak, but are you willing to listen He's close, he's here, he's near, he's present, but will we let him speak to us? The third thing, though, that we need to get out of this, the reason it's important that we understand that God is always present, and we just need to be transparent about this and say that I think a lot of times people feel abandoned by God. What your circumstances, whether they're good or bad or indifferent, often people will feel like they've been abandoned. And we feel distant from God. But when we do, I can promise you, it's not because of geography that you feel distant from God. The promise from Scripture is clear that He is present. But when our chamber pot is full of nastiness, we're not clean. Relationally, we're separated from God. It's that old adage of when you feel like God is far away, who moved? It wasn't him, it's us. That we go our own way because of sin and because of selfishness and fleshy things. And although God is present, our sin reveals to us a relational separation that occurs. Our sin can make us want to hide from God. Our sins can make us feel alone. But God calls us to something higher and better. And so where do we go from here? What do we do with all this? Well, I think the first thing is, if you're running, stop running. You've got to stop running. That's an issue of surrender to say, okay, God, I know you're here. I'll stop running. I want to be present with you and not just physically present because he already is, but to be relationally present, stop running. And so although in our flesh we may be able to get away with all kinds of things, you may be able to get away with cheating on your taxes, you may be able to get away with having that affair, surfing that porn, you may be able to get away from stealing stuff at work or whatever, but God is present and he knows and we've got to be able to come clean and stop running. Stop running like Jonah. Stop running like Adam and Eve. The second thing I would, com- I would uh, call you to is to be the hugs and the feet of God. Now, we talk about being the hands and feet a lot around here. It's a part of our DNA to be a church that's not stuck in the building. That we want to go out and serve and show a community, a missionary heart of God to show community the love of God as we serve. But what I mean by being the hugs and feet means there is never a time that anyone in this place should feel lonely. Never. It's something we got to work on. Every church does. But to grow into this idea of being physically present with one another, that means if you see someone alone, go put your arm around them. Go invite them to come sit next to you. Yes, I know it's out of your comfort zone, but it could have eternal ramifications. To not let people feel alone. To invite them into your life, even just for a moment. To share in communion or to sit next to you or whatever it is. To be the hugs and feet. Because when we are physically present with one another, what does it demonstrate? It demonstrates God's presence through us. And isn't that who he calls us to be? That we can show a world what his physical presence looks like by our own presence and it starts here if we can't love on one another and be the hugs and feet here we'll never be able to do it on the other side of these walls 
to be called to be the hugs and feet to someone else. And it will do two things. It will solve your own loneliness if you're feeling lonely. And it will solve someone else's loneliness, which removes the barrier that keeps us away from God because he is present. The last thing is this. Repent. Repentance is not a popular picture in this world that we live in. Because repentance means that you recognize that you've gone your own way. But God calls us to stop going our own way and to turn and go his way. Repentance is a picture of sanctification. Of allowing God to clean us from the inside out. To do away with that habitual sin. Will we still make mistakes? Of course we will. But to do away with the habitual sin, which is doing the same thing over and over and over again. Here's what it takes. Surrender it to God and let him take it on. Surrender it and say, God, I can't do this without you. It's part of what I have written very first thing in my Bible on the inside cover. Here's what it says. I have written Psalm 139, 23 and 24. I pray this all the time. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I often begin my prayers this way. God, if there's anything that stands between you and me, remove it so I'm not blinded from you, so I can make sure that I see you. But also, I don't want anything in the way that will hamper my prayers to you. Nothing in the way that will happen that will mess up my relationship with you. Reveal to me the things that I've put in my life that are barriers that stand between you and I. Remove them and then help me to surrender it because he will do the cleansing of the pot. He will do that sanctification, but we got to cooperate, which is to surrender it and to not just go, yeah, I'm just going to keep doing the same old thing because it's comfortable or fun or safe, but instead to be in alignment with God so that not only he's physically present but he's relationally present moving us transforming us changing us growing us in every way and so this morning then you're invited to do something with this and I think the most appropriate thing is communion we remember the body and the blood of Jesus the broken body the bloodshed the bread and the cup that you represent this And part of what we see through Scripture is as we come to the Lord's table, that it is a time of reflection and repentance, but to come to the table, which also reminds us of what Jesus did at the cross, which is he pays the penalty for you and me to set us free so that we can be washed clean, so that our vessel can be set apart for something good and right and holy, washed out, cleaned out of all the junk that's inside and to be made brand new. Jesus is willing to do that for you all the time and today. And so today, what I want to say to you is God is here. God is in this place. And you're invited to his table to share a meal with him. To share a meal of bread and juice that reminds us of the body and the blood broken and shed so that we can be made clean. So you're invited this morning to do that. There are stations up front and in the back. We're going to sing together for just a couple minutes, give you time to share in that. But take it seriously. Stop running. Be the hugs and feet. Go find someone that's by themselves. Repent. And come into the presence of the Lord at his table and share in this communion with him. Maybe one of the best ways to do it is to see him give you the bread. This is my body broken for you. To see him pass the cup. This is my blood shed for you. Come into this place where we commune together. You're invited to that now and then we'll come back together and we'll pray and finish up today.
and sing. Father, we praise you for this time that we've had to come together to worship, to honor you, to love one another, to experience your love. Your grace is amazing. I pray that as we go from this place today, that you move in our hearts and our minds, you transform us and grow us, and that we will be changed. It's in Jesus that we pray. Amen. Hey, I want you to stay there for just a second. Our um, Dominican missions team is uh, if any of you are here, if you could go ahead and come on up. We want to pray over our missions team uh, as we get ready to head out. By the way, 9 o'clock on Saturday, you're invited to come and uh, hang out with us. We'll be leaving from the parking lot here at 9. We'd love for some of you to come out and pray over this team as we uh, head out to the uh, DR. And uh, we've done this in all the services today. And so this isn't the whole team. I think we have 14 total that are going, uh, but we've all gotten to be prayed over through the day. Come on close, guys. And so if you would, pray along with us. And I want to invite you to uh, pray for this team this week. If you could put us on your daily prayer list, pray for our safety, pray for the people that we're going to go talk to, and uh, especially you know on Saturday and over the weekend and next week as we're gone. But if you could be uh, praying through that, that would be a, a blessing to us. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this team that you've assembled together. You knew in advance because you're all-knowing exactly who would go and who we would be and who we will touch. And I know that you're already working in those towns, in the barrios, in those poor areas that we'll be going. And I pray that you begin to work in their hearts and their minds now, that they'll be ready to receive good news from us, that they'll receive it from our hugs, from our words, from our prayers, through the music that we play and sing for them. And I pray that you protect us. I pray that you protect our team, our hearts, our minds, our bodies, that you protect us physically, spiritually, emotionally, and mentally, and that we will go and we will have your Holy Spirit guide us. Your promise in Acts 1.8 is that we will receive power to be your witnesses. I pray that it's true for each person here to be a witness in their own towns, in their cities, in their neighborhoods, in their communities, in their workplaces, and school. And I pray that for us as we go into this city, that we will have your power to be your witnesses. I pray that lives are changed forever and that we will see people in heaven because of the work that's done every day in this city through this place, but also in the Dominican as we head out there next week. And so we thank you in advance for what you're about to do. It's in name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Love you. Thank you. Have a great day. We'll see you soon.